This is Big Man Tyrone, and you're about to watch the MTG Cabal cast with your hosts, Wode, Thirsty, and Reptar. Sub to us on all your podcast networks at MTG Cabal Cast and YouTube. Hey guys, welcome to the newest episode of the Cabal Cast. You've got me and Rep here. Uh, Wode is still nursing a new baby. He's not nursing himself, like he's not Doing breastfeeding the a child, yeah. but he's helping it, helping it get along. Uh, we've got a lot to cover today. It's been kind of a slow season, but there have been some pretty big happenings. We had Mythic Edition confirmed. Mm -hmm. We have pretty much the full RNA spoiler up, so we're going to be covering a little bit of stuff there that we think is good or bad pickups. Mm -hmm. And there's been something kind of interesting happening lately on the sidelines, specifically with Mana Severance. Uh, so we're going to be touching a little bit on that, and that's pretty much all we've got for today, and then we'll close out with picks, obviously. Yep. So. Uh, yeah, so I think one of the bigger things and kind of interesting over the weekend because I was gone but this made waves while I was basically in the woods in North Carolina the Challenger decks are coming back yeah and so I actually had to get a quick recap on what they were and uh, these are the decks that in uh, Kaladesh era standard were basically printings of the five most popular quote unquote tier decks in the format so you had the Marta Vehicles list you had Green Black Constrictor you had uh, mono, mono blue. red, yeah, mono blue Kefnet, and yep. something with Oketra because it basically was all five of the uh, <clears throat> gods yeah. from Amoket. And it's a pretty interesting announcement. It seemed like the product people were kind of low on. They were fairly ambivalent, aside from the Hazaret deck. That much like yep. the Grixis uh, EDH deck of yore was the hottest selling one because it had Hazaret and it had Chandra and it had Heart of Kirin. So the value on that was infinite, and it just made standard playable. You know, yep. you were either playing snakes or you're playing vehicles at that point in time, and this was just the the most bang for your buck. Yeah, uh, I have some interesting feelings on this as a player and somebody who's <clears throat> been kind of moving to uh, arena as my go-to for standard. But I'm interested in what you think, Jason. So, I, I mean, from an LGS standpoint, it's great because being able to get these cards out there, one, it makes them cheaper. It's easier to sell cheap cards. Mm -hmm. Two, it moves sealed product. On it helps move singles. It's also one of those things that I think is nice because, and we'll touch on this a little bit in the Mythic Ed, uh, it seems like Wizards is getting further away from trying to drive traffic to the LGS. And releasing these products as a way to sort of get people back in the door of, yes. okay, you know what, we're going to have a teach them how to play weekend. Bring your new players, they can grab a challenger deck with a couple boosters, and we'll show them how to play or something. Yep. And I I think it's good that they, and you know, I'm, I'll eat my hat for this one. I think Wizards made a decision that was good for an L, from an LGS perspective for the LGS. Yeah. Uh, now, granted, a lot of pay, a lot of places that are going to get this, like Pack Fresh Magic, they're just going to crack it, sell the singles, fine. But for your bread and butter LGS, I think it's a great release. I think it's awesome to get. You know, presumably there's going to be a Teferi in there. Mm -hmm. There's going to be Niv Mizzets. Yep. There's you know going to be some spells list we'll maybe even see if it still shows up the tempest gin list or yeah fingers crossed which is mastery some people uh, are specking on that this might be a way to get non-foil nexus of fates into the hands of the players so that if that continues to be a deck you no longer have to see forest with nexus of fate written on it on stream anymore yeah oh. Uh, I actually would not be surprised if that was the case because all they said about the buy box was this will be the only foil printing mm -hmm. so maybe at that point they knew you know well we have a way in because we can release challenger decks yeah. and throw it in there non-foil but i think overall it's going to be really good for an lgs yeah um I, yeah it's just I, great i agree with that uh, i didn't really think about it uh too much in regards to uh to an lgs standpoint i think it's another great product that an lgs can sell and get people started on standard and so in any way shape or form this is a way to get butts in seats you know, some yeah. of these standard decks are ridiculously expensive, and that's not what he has wanted from the mythic uh, rarity printing forward. They've been trying to drop the price of standard magic, and I think these are great for the average player. Uh, I come from an area where a lot of players are just kind of disenfranchised when it comes to card availability, and these decks are great for them. Yeah. The other thing that, and this is uh, kind of my opinion, it feels like we might be moving more towards... Uh, a living card game style of standard play so 
or, or maybe more of a Yu-Gi-Oh style model, which is these cards are released and they exist for three to six months by themselves. They have some ridiculous price tag on them. And then yep. WotC does what uh, has been termed tinning, which means the all the hotness that has been in the hands of players that can afford them are now printed into oblivion. They are worth nothing and they are super easy to get. And it makes the format really accessible. And it just allows players to play whatever they want. More people come out to play, more people enjoy the game, and it just makes for a better experience overall. With the arena product and how easy it is to basically build any deck you want by just kind of plugging away for free uh, through the, mm -hmm. the low-cost drafts into the low-cost constructed events that just require gold, you can basically just sit there and go infinite on wild cards and build any of these decks. Yeah. It, it takes very few resources. And if this is the parallel they want to make paper to Arena, I think this is great. Like, I don't really play Standard anymore, and if I could have waited six months to buy Tefries for Jeskai Control or whatever it is I might wind up playing in a couple of weeks, Wilderness Reclamation, Nexus, like, so be it. Yeah, I, I would have waited for this stuff had I known. Yeah, and I think, and I, I think that Konami with Tinning and Yu-Gi-Oh, they did two great things. One was for the company, they figured out a perfect model to extract the maximum amount of money out of your sealed product. Yeah. Because you've got your, you know, people that need it right now, that just love cracking stuff, they'll get it right when it comes out, they'll mm -hmm. pay for the boxes. A couple months later, the guy that has, you know, 20, 30 bucks a week to spend, he can pick up a challenger deck. He can pick up a tin, get the cards he needs. And yeah. then the next year, there's a master's set where something gets downshifted to common from rare, and, oh, well, nobody cares anymore. You can use it as draft chaff. Yeah. And I think financially, because like you said, Wizards has tried to make standard affordable. They've tried to make the game affordable. That's mm -hmm. why they made modern. They didn't want an eternal format that was beholden to the reserved list. And I think that this helps accomplish that and also reinforces... Don't MTG finance in standard if you're not pumping and dumping. Yeah. Just don't do it. Um, no. But I think that's definitely the case. And I don't. Th uh, Gavin Verity, I believe, made the announcement, but he never gave us a date for the deck list. I think he's, he might have been Koei and said April. Okay, I thought he said February. Yeah. Okay. So, oh, no, he did say February. They're releasing in April. Okay, that's what it is. So we might get it at uh, Cleveland, the, yeah. split, the first split Magic Fest Pro Tour. Which yeah. I expect there to be a ton of announcements at, just because we, we're beholden to WotC for information, like we said, about the new PTQ system, about how yeah. PTs are going to work, how our Planeswalker points are going to work, and a litany of other things. So yeah, that's going to be really interesting. And then, um, so, moving kind of cleanly from this, the Mythic Edition announcement was finally, I, I, I say finally, but was brought to light. And mm -hmm. people weren't sure, would we get another Mythic Edition? Would we get more Masterpieces? Would it just be in RAV? Is this going to be something moving forward? And while a lot of those questions have not been answered, what we do know is that we are going to get Mythic Edition Planeswalkers again for the next RAV set. And one could assume that with a new set name War for the Spark, that or War Over the Spark, whatever the Transformer style name is, we're going to most likely be getting them in the third RAV set as well. Yeah. So... There's a big lesson to be pulled from this for everyone. And that lesson is, when Watsi says they're retiring something, don't listen. It's a short-lived retirement. Yeah, it's very short-lived. Um, I, I think that moving away from the Hasbro toy shop to the more stable platform of eBay is a smart move. But when I touched on the Challenger decks, this is another one of those things that feels like they're moving away from the LGS. Yeah. You know, one of the nice things about Masterpieces, and yeah, I get it, people got burnt out on them. It made standards super cheap mm -hmm. because those packs were opened into the ground. Oh, yeah. For people trying to get mobile, Mana Crypt, Soul Ring Inventions, you know, the fetch lands, whatever. Yeah. And it disincentivizes shops getting sealed product mm -hmm. because you've already got to compete with wizards on amazon for prices and this just feels bad uh i do like that they are allowing a global shipping now because being on ebay as opposed to hasbro toy shop and that was a point they made that i agree with yeah being able to ship them to europe makes it 
way better for the European market. Uh, I mean, I I bought the last SDCC set for what was it, one ten or whatever it was that it retailed for on the Hasbro toy shop. Was that the uh, hieroglyph set? Yeah, the hieroglyph okay. set. Yeah, uh, it was buy listing to European vendors at GPs three months later for two hundred to two hundred twenty five dollars. Wow. Because they didn't have access to it over there. Yeah. And I think that this opens that up. And from a financial perspective, I think that's good. Yeah. Because it makes it more affordable overseas. Mm -hmm. I think the Walker choices were fine. Mm -hmm. Uh, The only one that had a super expensive foil was Dak Faden. I'm a little mad that Soren isn't just inside of a rock in his art. (laughs) In the hell vault. But yeah, Yeah. like, come on. You, You missed a perfect opportunity. Yeah. Uh, but other than that, man, 250 bucks for eight Planeswalkers, it's going to sell. They'll make oh, their money. Oh, of course. Uh, is the list of Planeswalkers out by chance? Yes, okay. uh, with art. Uh, there's New Karn, the Scion of Urza, whatever, the one from Dominaria. Yeah, Scion. Uh, Kaya and Domri are the new walkers in it. Oh, uh, Soren okay. Markov, Dak Faden, Original Tamiyo. Yes, I, all right. Yeah, I've got it up. I feel I just yeah. Uh, Ral again? Is no. Was no, he? Ral was in the first one. That so the article shows them first, and then if you scroll down, you get the full list. Yeah. Uh, and then I think the original Ajani. Uh, Mentor which, of Heroes. Or Mentor of Heroes. That's right. The Theros one. Green um, white. Yeah. Yeah. So that's that was an interesting choice, I thought, because. I don't see a lot of people clamoring for that. Yeah. Uh, and I feel like there were no misses on outside of the in-standard walkers, which I'll never count as a hit or a miss there in standard. You've got to move product. Yeah, yeah. People are going to buy them or not. It's. Yeah. Outside of the in-standard walkers, I think the first one didn't have any misses. I mean, even Agent of Bolas still sees play in Modern Legacy and EDH. Oh, yeah. Yeah. He's definitely uh, a staple. But... As far as foils, I think this hits Dak Faden. I don't think it hits Tamio uh, and her price on foils. I don't think it hits any of the other walkers, really, too hard on foils. Yeah. Soren was printed in two sets as a foil. Yep. Um, I don't anticipate any of these suddenly tanking in price. No. I think Jay About is the only one that might see a big swing because she's currently in standard. And yeah. she's not being played. So if she sees play, then everything goes up, right? I'll... Yeah, that's true. A rising tide. And she she will be in standard for quite some time. So she would be, for me, of all of those, you know, like, Frasca's from the old one is 40 bucks right now. I think so. I think Jay is probably going to be 30 to 40 I think she's probably a fine pickup. I don't think she's going to go down in price. Yeah. No, I think that... But... Yeah. Not... I don't know, I'm not a huge fan of the Mythic Edition stuff only being moved through, only because it's moved through Hasbro's proprietary systems, it doesn't come from an LGS, so with the announcement of Mythic Edition first, they take again from the LGS, but the Challenger decks I think came later that day, the next day, so they gave yeah. with the other, like literally taking with one hand and giving with the other, giving with the other yep. to, to, L, to LGSs, and I don't understand this aside from a complete... Uh, not cash grab, but just money making kind of scheme. You know, I would yeah. love it if this was an LGS product. It, it would keep people moving to LGSs. It would give stores a chance to, to sell singles and keep people yeah. coming in. Um, otherwise, you know, if they want to keep doing this with planeswalkers, keep going the full art stuff. Everything's going to be a hit in time. There are people that collect planeswalkers. Like yeah. so many people just have the planeswalker collection, and the further they go down the list the more often they're going to start hitting. Like, there are still some clunkers. Yeah. You still have Tybalt, and you still have the um, the the six mana or five mana Garuk. Oh, the Apex Predator? No, no, no. The two double, the two triple green from a core oh, set. Oh, yeah. yeah. Compared yeah, to the yeah. other Garuks, he's a clunker. Yeah. You know? But other than that, you're right. You've got a lot of stuff to hit on here. Yeah. We have yet to see a Jason either of these, right? Correct. Yeah. So, yeah. Bellerin has infinite foil printing, so I really don't expect a full art Jace Bellerin to kind of pull weight, but uh, no. if they do the Fringe flip... Prodigy. Yeah, I was just going to say the flip. Uh, Planeswalkers, uh, 
even mind sculptor this might that might drive foil prices for things like ftv etc yeah. for chase mind but it's just interesting to keep an eye on it it does shake things up and it makes some of these more accessible like sword markov is always really hard to find yeah like anybody <laughs> Fifteen dollars for a non-foil, something like that, ridiculous. Yeah, everybody that has a Soren Markov has it because they play it. They don't have it because it's extra, yeah. unless they're a grinder on on the floor somewhere, right? Yeah. Other than that, they have it because they play it, and you just mm -hmm. can't find them outside of that. Exactly. So I like the population increase on these. I think they're cute in regards to a type of product, but I yeah. don't, they're not a huge finance driver. I don't think. No, it, it'll. The print run on these is significantly smaller than masterpieces. Yeah, and I think that that's part of why you're not going to see as much rubber banding with the prices. They're fairly inelastic. So yeah, the one, the only one I'm curious about, and this one might actually have foil implications, is uh, Kaya. Oh no, sorry, this is the new Kaya, not the old Kaya. Yeah, this is this is new Kaya. Yeah. Okay, sorry, I thought it was the old one, which only ha which has the alt art. Okay. Never yeah. Mind. Disregard. So, on the topic of standard, oh. Uh, We've been talking over the last couple of days cards that we would pick up for our our own usage, cards that we're going that we would like to sit on timelines for those, and we've kind of compiled a list. We have distilled it down to like a couple categories and a few picks within each to kind of keep things small and, and give everybody an idea of what we look for when we're looking at a new standard set, and you know if possible where we look for this information to see what's going on. Uh, so we can just do a quick you know, back and forth on this. We'll, we'll basically cascade down from, like, things you really need to look out for. If you can find them still at these prices, move on it all the way down to, you know, hold off. This yeah, is inflated because these, these are pre-release prices. Yeah. Yeah. So, to start up at the top, some of the white-hot stuff uh, that I've seen is Wilderness Reclamation. And despite the fact that people are looking at this for modern, I think this is an EDH and a standard card. This is going to be an EDH mm -hmm. card forever. You know, it does the exact yeah. same thing as Seaborn Muse and uh, the profit and profit accrued fix, which is now banned. Well, not yeah. now for years banned, but it has immediate card standard. Is fine. Oh, oh yeah, right. Thanks. Flash <laughs> on all your creatures. Cool. Uh, <laughs> this is a card that allows Bant Nexus to play a little more interesting game because you now have a second trigger at end of turn, so you can untap, stack them, unt. Untap two lines with Teferi, cast a Nexus, re resolve Wilderness Reclamation, untap, and search for Iskanta, or double search for Iskanta, yeah. sometimes triple, depending on what you have. Todd Anderson wrote about it. Uh, his article went up at the beginning of the week. They uh, have a video of Bant Nexus up right now, Star City Games, and coming out next week is going to be a teamer version of the deck that sports Expansion Explosion that he believes is going to be the best version of the deck. Yeah. And this is just immediate uh, use of Wilderness Reclamation. This is a new card of the format. It fits perfectly into the Nexus shell, but we don't know yep. what it's going to look like moving forward. This could be this kind of an, an elf thing. It could be uh, something gruel related with experimental friends. You get a lot of burn. But yep. for $1.25, I think it's really hard to go wrong. I think this is yep. a, a 3 to $5 uncommon while it's in standard, as long as it's doing anything. And then in perpetuity, this is going to be a $5 plus uncommon because of EDH. Quest for Renewal? Was that the quest card that does Seedborn Muse that was randomly like around like $10 now? I believe so. Because it does the same thing. So yeah, long term this is easily like $5, $10 in there uncommon. Not yeah. close. No, not even. And the the other card I believe that is a an absolute must right now based on price and utility is Judith, Judith the Scourge Diva. And I believe we both agree on this. Oh yeah. Uh, I believe this card, the, the primary driver isn't going to be standard just because it's a little hard for me to envision that right now, but modern because she has a relevant creature type in human, and while she's a legend, she's a great sideboard card for that deck against the current format, which does involve sweepers on the Star City f circuit, but yep. blue-white and Sky Control are fairly popular, and moving on to the GP circuit, if uh, humans continues to fight the way it is against the meta... This might even be a decent card in the Bad Sphere matchup when you just want to involve yourself in combat and just try and make trades because you can start doming for one, and you have this yeah. reach now that humans just never did. You can cast a, this human off of any of your lands because it is super relevant, and it is only $2. And I yeah. think that is criminal for a card that's, that seems to slot in almost immediately to the side yeah. of humans. It's aggressively costed, it's efficient, it does everything you want out of a sideboard card in that deck. Yeah. 
It's amazing. So that's, um, that's me. What do you got? So for me, I'm really big on two cards in particular. Okay. Uh, Smothering Tithe. It's around $2 right now. Uh, it's the whenever someone draws a card, they have to pay two or you get a treasure token. That is I, white, correct? It is white, yes. It's in a color that doesn't get that effect. It's the type of thing that EDH decks love uh, because some color combinations, I'm looking at you, red, white, never draw cards. You just don't. Nope. If you don't have blue, it's kind of hard. Uh, I also think you could see some fringe play in Eternal formats. I'm not sure where, but I think that long term, it's easily a 5 to $10 card. Uh, something else that I think is good and has a little bit of standard applications, depending how the meta shakes up, mm -hmm. honestly, end raise runners. Uh, if we get an efficient ramp deck with you know all of the ramp that we have right now, I think it could be a good high end finisher there. Okay. It's also uh, crater hoof, which of course is a finisher in elves yep. in legacy. It's sometimes a finisher in modern. It's a finisher for a lot of decks in the EDH. Yep. And it's less than a dollar. And I I think that card should easily be five bucks. Yep. Uh, and may even in standard get as much as five to ten depending how the meta shakes out. Because yep. again. These cards are going to be in there for a while. Yeah, we're seeing a ton of ramp right now. We starting all the way down at the bottom of the curve with Lanor elves and moving up to the uh, the Lotus elf. Yeah, they, we're we're going to get a, a lot of uh, we're going to get a lot of ramp, and we're going to have a lot of card draw uh, between just mono green and Simic and the way you can play around with counters. My only concern for end race forerunners is that um, Porkins from Eldritch Moon did not pick up yeah. the price. And I, That's true. For the he life of me, forget the name of that card. I can't remember. I just remember it's a big boar. Yeah, a big dumb yeah. boar uh, that I thought yeah. has a merge. It does, but I think one of the big differences is it just gives the power toughness buff. It doesn't give any keywords. I don't think it gives Vigilance or Trample. Yeah, I, Trample on Enray's Forerunners is super powerful. Decimator of yeah. Provinces. Yes, no, that's they get Trample. One. Oh, it does? Okay, well, my bad. He costs yeah, it, 10 could be or wrong. 6 and 3. Oh, he still costs more for a 7-7 seven, oh. seven that does less. So Enray's Forerunners yeah. is actually just strictly better in EDH because while it is still green, it is more easily castable and does more at a lesser rarity. Than, yeah. than uh, Porkins. Yeah, Crater Hoof is 8 and gives plus X, X, plus X, and Trample. Yeah. Whereas Forerunners gives at least Vigilance. Yeah. Granted, it's only plus 2, plus 2, but Vigilance and Trample is incredibly relevant. Oh, yeah, absolutely. They basically took Decimator Provinces. I'm looking at this now. Emerges 6 and 3 green for a 7-7. Seven, seven. That yeah. gives plus 2, plus 2, and Trample to other creatures, and it has Trample and Haste. They literally dropped the rarity on this card and made it better. I don't... Watsy. Yeah, that's interesting. Great. Yeah. Maybe um, play design realized that that was the way to go because nobody was ever going to cast Decimator Provinces in any format. <laughs> could be. Hopefully. I mean, you can't even fetch it with uh, Natural Order. It's not green. No, it's purely colorless. It is... It just happens to have it's it. It's bad. Yeah. Yeah. Um... And then cards to avoid. Yep. So the one that I am really big on. Avoiding. Sweet Jesus, people. Don't buy Vanifar at $15. This set's going to be opened into the ground. Oh, yeah. It's not going to be that good in standard. Modern? Absolutely, it could be that good. We'll, we'll see how it goes. I know there's a bunch of lists rolling around. There was... Uh, couple of teamer lists all of them use scrib ranger as like part of the kill chain yep like 15 dollars for this guy come on there's no way don't do it yeah it could be 50 dollars after it rotates it's not going to be 15 dollars while it's in standard it's not to ferry yeah it, it's not this had a i think a zero day price of 25 and it's whittled its way down to 15 just to give everybody an example of what this card's been doing recently and yeah, I, it might stabilize at ten, but that you're still saving yourself twenty bucks if you just wait another three weeks, two weeks yeah. on this. It's maybe a week. Who yeah. knows? Just wait until player population increases this card 
uh, this card's quantity yeah. instead of uh, vendor population because it's really right now only vendors can predict. The moment yeah. players get their hands on their pre-release product, <clears throat> we start to fight over the floor on these prices. Yeah, race to the bottom. Oh yeah. Um, the other one that I really don't understand is Ravager Worm. That's pre-ordering on TCG for five dollars. Yep. How is this any better than Carnage Tyrant? So it's I, not. I don't think it is, but. I think what's pumping it up right now are the articles that uh, Owen has something up on Star City about Ravager Worm. I have not read it yet, so good or bad, I don't know. Yeah. I, um, I mean, the one me. relevant thing is I guess it does hit search. Yeah. But if I'm spending six mana for something that can be countered, mm -hmm. something that can be removed, mm -hmm. and something that has no evasion... Mm -hmm. That feels really bad if it doesn't just win me the game. I, I wholeheartedly agree. And I think some of the price is not only on the articles and what uh, pros have said about this and the fact that Gruel just looks insane, but it is also built on the fact that it looks like we might be playing Fires in Standard again. That's true. We have new yeah. Fires of Yavamaya and Riot stacks. Yeah. So when this comes in, you can not only make it a 5-6, but you can give it haste, which is a little more than Carnage Tyrant has going for it on that first turn. Yeah. This is, if you played back in Fire's standard, it, it looks like they tried to remake Flame Tongue Kabu without remaking mm -hmm. Flame Tongue Kabu, because it comes in and it has a big, splashy effect on the current meta. Yeah. You know, you're just yep. going to punch something out of the air, or you're going to take out uh, something like Search for Iskanta, which I believe is... Experimental Frenzy might be the other enchantment you'll see in Standard. Right oh, now. yeah. It's really those two. Yeah. Although think... it's only a land with an activated ability, so it's only Search after it flips. So it oh, yeah, hit Frenzy, sorry, actually. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. Yeah. I'm a big old dummy. It can hit Hedonis Climb, though, which yes. has been climbing in price for weeks. Uh, um, on the back of results and uh, test lists, yeah. Yeah. Because Hedonis Climb triggers... The same way everything else does. And plus one, plus one counters. Yeah. So, of course, let's do it. Yeah. So, yeah. all the adapt shenanigans, like Hadana's Climb immediately triggers anything that has a, when this gets a plus one, plus one counter on it, and it's just another quick, easy way to fuel anything like that. So is the Fires of Yavamaya card, whose name yeah. escapes me right now. It's not Cinder Flame. Let's see if I can find this real quick. Um... So what would be your cards to avoid? So the first one on my list of things to avoid is uh, another card for the Humans archetype, but the reason I want to avoid this is based solely on price, and it is Lavinia Azorius Renegade. I think this card is also really powerful for humans. This might actually be main deckable depending on where the modern format shifts, but I don't see it doing a lot. Like a lot of people said, oh, it's another answer to Tron, and it is. It, you're absolutely right with that. But there's some other knickknacks that it stops, mainly the Pacts. So Amulet yeah. Titan, it turns off the Summoner's Pact. Valka, it turns off Summoner's Pact. Anybody relying on, nobody plays Slaughter Pact, but Pact of Negation as well. So Force they, of Will and Legacy. Exactly. Y you turn that off. And I think this is a great card, don't get me wrong. I think this is going to see play in Standard all the way down. I just don't think it's a $5 card right now. Yeah. And that's the only reason why I would avoid it. The... Especially at rare, knowing that there's going to be a f promo printing. Yes. I don't think that's worth it. Uh, I already said my piece on Vanifar. So yeah. I want to bring up another card that people are very high on, and it is Hydroid Crisis. Ugh. This card is currently $9. It is half of Sphinx, Sphinx Rev with a body. There's no list for it right now. Nobody's playing it. You know, with Wilderness Reclamation, sure, you can do some cute things. This card does not beat Expansion Explosion. It is no. infinitely susceptible while it's on the stack. And I think this is going to go the same way that Ulvenwald Hydra did, which is super pumped for pre-release time. People are, are playing around with it. They saw Ulvenwald Hydra the same way they see Krasis as another miniature effect, but this time uh, it's Sphinx's Rev instead of Primeval Titan, because Ulvenwald Hydra fetched one land but yeah. only when it ETB'd. And then it disappeared. And it's gone. 
And I think that's going to happen to Hydroid Crisis. To me, this screams EDH and only EDH, just because of where the format is and the amount of counter spells that you can throw around. Maybe if there's some kind of awkward, like, teamer mid-range to aggressive shell, and you can use the can't be countered, uh, creatures can't be countered clause on your fires if you have a Maya, you can make yeah. this work. Or maybe you wind up casting it for six, gaining three, and hold up some kind of counter magic, but I do not see this card maintaining a $9 price tag after release. No. I, I think if it had flash, mm -hmm. maybe, but it doesn't. There's no reason. This is a bulk mythic. Yeah. Uh, so one thing that I think could go either way, mm -hmm. uh, for me, Spawn of Mayhem, it's currently $15, which seems high, but it's really aggressive for the spectacle cost. And I think that especially right out of the gate, mm -hmm. as we've seen with every standard ever, efficient, aggressive decks tend to win the day for the first little while after mm -hmm. standard forms. Oh, yeah. So I think that for right now, 15 might be about right. And I also think that it is so aggressively costed that if we start to see these Rakdos burn decks in Modern, the Saffron Olive Special take off, mm -hmm. Spawn of Mayhem could see Modern play because three mana for that body is pretty good. Yeah. But I don't know that it has the ability in standard to maintain a $15 price point, even at Mythic. I just, I don't know. I think it closes out games pretty well, especially uh, with the trigger that it has. And yeah. nobody's really been talking about what a Jund deck in standard looks like, and I think at the end of the day, once people have figured out what the best aggro deck is, if that aggro deck is Mono Red 12 Bolt, or it's Rakdos or Gruul, we still could wind up with a Jun deck that uses this as a high-end, it's quote-unquote high-end finisher at, at four. Yeah. And no matter what you're looking at, this card is pretty much going to cost four in a Jun deck. Either you're going yeah. to hit somebody with a burn spell and cast it for three, or you're just going to cast it for four. And that is for four, yeah. so reliable for Jund, it hurts. That's, yeah. what, that's what you want. You want your cards to do the same thing every time, and you want them to get the same value every time. And this card does that at and I think this, you're right. This is a card that goes either way because we don't know what this format's going to look like once you know the the MPL gets their hands on it, and yeah. we're several weeks in. Yeah. Uh, what do you think could go either way? So one of the things that I, I think can go either way, and it's based solely on the fact that I'm not a hundred percent about the archetype, is Cinder Flames, and. I don't think this card is going to be good in standard, so the $4.25 price tag it has right now is most likely going to tank probably somewhere between one or two. Yeah, I don't think a, an aggressive gruel deck wants this, I don't think a mid or late game gruel deck wants this, it has better cards to cast even out of the sideboard. I think this is a modern burn sideboard card. Yeah. Uh, as, a, as a burn player in Legacy, I have the benefit of being able to play upwards of eight pyrostatic pillar effects and sulfuric vortex to clock my opponent to make sure that the game ends when I need it to. In Modern, yeah. I only have Idol out of the Great Rebel. I have yep. four copies of pyrostatic pillar. While this is half the, the amount of damage off of a pyrostatic pillar or, or Eidolon, yeah. I also get stapled onto it a destructive revelry as needed. Yeah. So against either a game, uh, deck that wants to play a short game like Storm or KCI, where I could really benefit from the additional pyrostatic uh, pillar triggers, I think this is where that card's going to shine. I don't think this is a, a control card or anything like that. I think this is a card where, if the game ends on turn six, it's purely because of because this card got you there. It's not because your goblin guides did ten damage this game. You yeah. know, they put in their standard four to six, they got you what they needed to, and then Cinder Cindervines finished it out. Yeah. But we won't know that for a little bit. We won't know if this is really worthy of the sideboard. Right now, Burn is a Boros style deck because it needs rest in peace. It needs Path to Exile in the current format because of Phoenix's thing in the ice dredge. You know, these are yeah. the cards it needs. It can't really go back to being Naya right now. So picking this up at four might be fine. It might be a six to ten dollar card in the very long run. We can't really look at Eidolon of uh, the Great Revel as being uh, an incredibly good correlation because Eidolon turns sideways and attacks. This does not. 
And it was in a Theros block that did not get opened at all. Yeah, nobody really liked Theros. So, yeah. you know, we have that. But, I, like I said, these are the reasons why I think this card can either be a hit or a miss. And at 425, I'm not buying in. I'm going to wait until a week or two later when things come down and this price tag probably drops to about 2 to $3. And then that's when I'll move in on at least my place. Yeah. <clears throat> Yeah, that's probably about when I'd get into. I may pick up a foil for EDH. Mm -hmm. Because in, like, stacks lists that have green and red, that's probably fine. Yeah. But I don't think out of the gate it should be $4. No, this is... A foil for this card as well could be a long-term... A good long-term hold. It might be, like, Flames of the Blood Hand, which just all of a sudden became this really hot card in Burn and Reign of Gore. Both of those cards were just, like insanely popular for like six to nine months and must-haves in your 75 and the same yeah. thing could happen here so if you could score foils pretty cheaply i think you might be able to make out like a bandit on those yeah all right uh, so cards like this next section is basically just going to be about foils and foils that you need to get your hands on as that we think you need to get your hands on as soon as humanly possible so what do you got uh, mine is going to be promo growth spiral. Okay. So you and I have been talking about it for a while. We think this allows some form of team or scape shift, the bring to light versions, to actually play a genuine tempo game. Mm -hmm. uh, you get to run things like spells pierce. You get to run things like mana leak and actually run a tempo plan with a combo win behind it, which can be incredibly powerful. Yep. Uh, it's also just a sweet looking full art foil. Uh, and I think following the trend of recent foils, it could be, you know, the full art opt. Uh, it was, you know, four bucks while it was being handed out and then shot up after that. And I think that it's the type of card that, especially for modern, which eternal formats, people love foiling decks out. Mm -hmm. I think it's a great pickup personally. Yeah, I, I think so too. I've liked this card ever since it was spoiled as the promo version. That was my plan as well, was to try and pick up some set foils and some promos just to mix and match in modern. Uh, teamer scape shift and bring to light have been decks we've been talking about for a while and we don't i mean, we just want to make this clear we don't think it makes those decks any better than they are now it makes them more playable and there's a huge difference there basically this slots in over explore because it allows yeah. you to play that proactive game plan this doesn't break the arc we don't think this is going to break the archetype open or anything else no. i think this might also fit in uh what do you want to call it? amulet titan oh yeah yeah, I can see that, too. Yeah, you might be able to slide it in there, so you can find a third deck for it. Uh, I think this yeah. is just, uh, hands down, uh, a great card. And uh, I think, the for me, the foil to pick up immediately would be Wilderness Reclamation, just because in those first couple of weeks, before people really get their claws into standard, I think this card is going to be underpriced for a hot minute. Yeah. And as I mentioned, this card is just going to live in EDH. You will always have a way to get rid of this card to some EDH players somewhere. They will always want it. So regular and foil is a pickup. And we don't have prices on any of this stuff yet, so it's hard to say if you should move in on the first price you see on it when it goes up on TCG Player or other vendors. Or wait a couple of weeks, but I think this card is just an immediate target. You just got to find yeah. this card as soon as you can in foil. Yeah, I, I think... You know, like I said, with Quest for Renewal, which is now, uh, it's half Seedborn Muse. It untaps all your creatures during each untap. It's still a ten dollar foil. Yep. I, it's it's a type of thing that very easily, again, you can just always get rid of this to somebody. Yep. So. And then for RNA pickups, the last thing we want to touch on are just foils to hold off on. You gotta you gotta give this like close to a month for these prices to settle in because these cards are going to be volatile and foil and non and moving in is going to be dangerous yeah uh the big one for me is incubation druid mm -hmm. i know it's one that a lot of people especially for edh looked at and they said oh man this makes for an amazingly efficient hulk pile because you can get incubation druid vigian crafter the one that's blue and one untap something with a plus one plus one and mm -hmm. torch runner and then one hulk pile have infinite mana yep but you know, the non-foils on this card are already $4. So I'm not sure out of the gate the foils aren't going to be like 15 20 which I think is high, mm -hmm. at least while it's in standard. Um, I think that long-term, 15 is probably about right. Yeah. But if you're trying to make anything on it and get in on the right time, I'd wait about a month, month and a half until we start to see the foil trickle down to, honestly, I could see it at like 
six or seven dollars while it's in standard. Yep, I, I agree. The, the creature types on this card are relevant. Uh, in elf, druid doesn't really matter. Nobody's playing you know, druids in modern. Yeah, it has immediate implications all over the place, but the the slash point you just gotta watch out for. Yeah. Uh, also along those lines, we already talked about Vanifar and non foil, foil Vanifars. I wouldn't touch, not until we're on the cusp of our first actual modern event. If 5 O's start going out with Vanifar, then you might want to move in then if you're the kind of person that wants to own them and hold on to them. If yeah. you're lucky enough to open one, I would move them immediately. This is yeah. not a card I would ever want to hold the bag on. I mean, it, okay, great. It has EDH implications and people love making their generals foil. Mm -hmm. I... You only need one of those foil, and if you're going in on pod, sure, you'll want four foils, but there are so many price barriers to that. Oh, I want to foil a pod list out. Great. You've got to get foil phantasmal images for a lot of the lines. You've got to get foil kiki jikis, which, unless you're going for the from the vault, are like 25 30 40 bucks. Mm -hmm. There's quite a bit there that you would have to invest to foil that out in modern, so I would hold off on foils. Yeah. By all means. I, I don't think it's worth it right now. Yep, absolutely. And uh, is there anything else in your hold off on section you want to... Uh, not really. Maybe Growth Chamber Guardian. I That's another one that I feel I could go either way. It's great because it's an Elf Crab Warrior, which is a sweet creature type. Yep. And it kind of fits that role of uh, Elvish Clan Caller. Yeah. Which has been showing up here and there in Modern Elves lists, but... I don't think this is good enough to see play in Modern Elves. No. This is so. one of those cards that I was talking about with the new Fires of Yavimaya. Yeah. Play Fires on two, thanks to Landmore Elf. On three, you untap, you play Growth Chamber Guardian. You put a counter on it, you get another Growth Chamber Guardian. You play that because you have four mana. You go get another Growth Chamber Guardian, and the next turn you dump another two into play, and you just have yeah. an army in a can. Yeah. I think it's good, but I don't know how good it is. It requires a lot of setup to get that to work. It has a very low floor and a very high ceiling. Yeah. And those are the kind of cards that we just don't want to want to touch when they yeah. when they're spoiled when they first come out. You know, thankfully, TCG player has no prices on any foils right now. Yeah. But now that we're kind of through with our RNA stuff, we can move over to Mana Severance and the spike that was this week. Yeah. So, when did this start? The, so, the big pop on Mono Severance. The, the big pop started on Friday. It shot up to about seven dollars. Okay, from uh, nothing, and right? From yeah, it was it was bulk, uh, and then today it hit twenty five. Uh, so you know, when I first saw this, my first inclination was, oh, it's obviously on the reserve list, and that's why. Uh, well, through Reptar's research, he found it's not on the reserve list, which is amazing. It's almost like it should have been an Ultimate Masters. A set filled with things I thought were on the reserve list. Yeah, right. Um, and so I, it, well, you you can take it from here and say what uh, what your research found out after I mentioned, hey, we may want to touch on this. Oh yeah, uh, just taking a look around, it looks like the primary reason or the primary driver for this actually is a YouTube channel called the Spike Feeders. And I guess much like the Star City Commander series, they run an entire season's quote-unquote worth of games, and then they just kind of have an end-of-season game, and Mana Severance did extremely well there. I have not had the time to actually go back and watch the video. This is a channel that has about 3,000 subs right now, and each video gets about 2,000 views. Mm -hmm. Aside from that, there are two lists on MTG Top 8 for EDH, which I forgot was a thing in the past yeah. two weeks for a Turbo Zer list that uses Mana Severance to great efficiency, where after, let's say, lands 8 or 9, you just Mana Severance the rest of your lands away and your entire deck is live draws. Yep. Or you can just, like, flip it and dump everything into play. It's insane. Yeah. But from this, what we're seeing is that there's now almost no delay between Commander videos. So when you yeah. have the Versus series, which is the Commander Versus series, which is now going to be, I think, live on either Tuesday nights or Wednesday nights after hours. So like yeah. 6 p.m. or something. Uh, you have uh, these guys, the Spike Feeders. 
you have uh, laboratory game nights. maniacs. Yeah, game when they nights. Get there. Uh, game uh, nights. Yeah. I'm forgetting another one that has dragons in the name, but. Anything that just kind of comes out of nowhere, it doesn't see a ton of play, and all of a sudden just pop or just cleans up in a video, yep. you could just start seeing pop. You know, people could just start moving in on this stuff, or not. not. And it, it just, just means, means you've got, got to widen your scope, scope now. now. You, you can't, can't just say, all right, I'm going to pay attention to streams of data, X, Y, and Z, because these are the constructed formats, these are what matters, yes. this is what's going to push finance directly for things I care about. Like, Modest Modest Severance is a bulk, bulk card forever. forever. There, there are a lot of players that had it from the heydays of Extended, where this was combo paired with Goblin Charbelcher to win either a GP or a PT, I forget which. Yeah. And, and there are a ton, ton of people that have it for various formats. formats. Uh, like, like I said, EDH, some, some people, people still play Type 4, this is the Q card. Oh, yeah. And then, because they're not paying attention, all of a sudden now this card is worth something. They can dig out their copies and they can sell them. People, people were sitting, sitting on a bunch of these because, because they came with Tempest, Tempest bulk and now get, get rid of this. Yeah. It's, it's just, just another source to both pay attention to and a source of uh, just spiking cards. It's... Yeah, it's it's stuff. interesting because it's something we started to see a little bit in Kaladesh, where typically what would happen with cards that were good in EDH is... After they rotated and they started going down, they'd start to go up. Well, with Aetherflux Reservoir, right before rotation is when it started to go up. Immortal Sun, courtesy of Brawl, started to go up already. Uh, and it's going to be one that I think, honestly, could go up again once we get close to rotation. And you started to see the EDH timeline for this stuff get shorter and shorter and shorter. Mm -hmm. So now you're getting to the point where you can see it with, like, a 48 to 72 hour turnaround, yep. which is only barely faster than camera time at a Pro Tour or a GP or an SCG. I remember a couple years ago when Feline won the SCG on High Tide, you could buy Candelabras on Star City for less than what Star City's buy price was because their buy price just kept climbing throughout the event because it got more and more camera time. Yep. And you're getting to the point where EDH is getting faster and faster and, you know, it's it's kind of an adage among a lot of vendors that casuals drive the market. Your casual play days, you come in, hang out. They're the reason you can sell a soul ring in store for 2 to $3 and not feel bad about it. And you're starting to see that shift over towards now EDH, which is a format that, according to Sheldon, is all about kitchen table. You're wrong, Sheldon. Whatever. It's fine. Um but you're getting that quick turnaround finally. And it's yep. interesting to see that this is, as far as I can remember, the first time we've seen that 24 to 48 hours snap on a card yep. where it does really well on what seems like a niche channel. And then all of a sudden, boom, it explodes. Oh, yeah. So. And there have been times, times where people made calls, calls uh, in, on, on our, our Discord. Discord. I saw X, Y, or Z on this channel, yeah. and people yeah. move in on a forum, and it's, it's taken weeks, weeks for some of this stuff to pop. I'm trying yeah. to figure out, I can't remember, it's a Tefri card, that they, it's, it's not Tefri's protection, protection, it's similar, though, it's uh, used in Legacy, legacy Reanimator, Reanimator, sometimes. It's a blue card. And it was on a Star City Commander video. And I picked up my copies because I was going to be playing Blue Black Reanimator with an alternative sideboard plan. And then a couple weeks later, straight up. It was ridiculous. Yeah, and I think uh, Exsanguinate uh, foils went to pop recently. Yeah, that was they sick. they were one that did that too. Just all of a sudden, it did well in a video, and then the foils were through the roof. Yeah. So, so um, you know, and now you got to figure out. You can figure out if you want to. This allows you to figure out where you want to specialize now. Do you want to stay with constructed, uh, as we know, standard modern legacy, etc., and kind of specialize in that, or do you want to cater to what could be a larger crowd? And an easier crowd in Commander. Because a lot yeah. of jank that standard players are willing to get rid of, yeah. it's great in Commander. And yeah. they're happy to get rid of a lot of that stuff. Yeah. For um, whatever. Also, you know, depending on your local market, there is a value to be known as, oh, you need something for EDH? Find this guy. He's got it. Yeah. yeah. That, that was, 
uh, one of the cases of my LGS for years was dedicated to commander only because yeah. that, that, that was the majority of our players and in that case constantly churned. Yeah, and they, it's, they spend money. And it's, yeah, it's amazing. It, you, 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 you go, go out to events, events like Grand Prix, and you'll see a lot of vendors that have just high-end commander cases, just foil commanders. Um, yep. The blue-white commander that got reprinted in Modern Masters, the one that taxed. Not oh, wait, though, Grand and, Arbiter. Yeah. And Grand, Grand, Arbiter, August, August, Grand Arbiter. Yeah. Grand Arbiter, Augustine the Third. The foil of that card was like $150 thanks to Commander yeah. before it was reprinted in Modern Masters. Yeah. One. Like, so just, that, that timeline, timeline is ridiculous. Yeah. Modern Masters, one. one. It was $150 yeah. beginning of that. This, this is... is it, it's, it's a, a real, real market, market now. People, People have to pay attention, attention to this. Whether, Whether they, they want, want to or not is, is up to them. It's, it's no yeah. longer like the dregs of standard or bulk from years past. Things, things are real and things, things are live. And it's yeah. exciting. Yeah, I agree. I, I think it's great to finally see that type of start start to have an have have implications in the financial market. You know, there was two years ago, I started buying up foil mana breaches from seventh because I'm like, oh, this is a weird EDH card that does something taxing in a color people play stacks effects in. Mm-hmm. Granted, foil seventh popped independent of that oh, completely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But those types of things are something that you can see now, okay, this card's gonna be great in EDH. I don't have to wait years anymore. It may be 72 hours. You know, it could be a month, but it's a lot smaller window than it used to be, and I think that's great. Yeah. yeah. It, it, it puts, puts everybody, everybody on equal footing, footing now. You, you don't, don't have your each player just, just kind of slumming along, you know, yeah. waiting for their stuff to go up, hoping it goes up. You know, each yeah. player can now get into and out of the format quickly, easily, and effectively, as opposed to before. They didn't have to just play the pimpest of pimp. Yeah. It, 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 it's super nice that casuals like that can just do what they need to. Yeah. It's about time because Opera happened first, which is ridiculous. Yeah, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> and and then it didn't happen. Yeah, I'm fine <laughs> with that. Yeah, fair. But, uh, do we want to close out here like we do every week and then move into our picks? picks. Yes. And uh, again, again, I fired the whole episode. I'm going to go in on Wilderness Reclamation. That card is less than $2 right now, and I think this is an easy double up in the mid to long term. You gotta wait for people to do their thing and put the deck together, or you can just wait until ED takes over and the numbers disappear from the general pop. But yeah, I think it's the way to go. I think there's some vendors you gotta search off TCG player and kind of off site from a lot of the known vendors, and you can still find them for a dollar or less. They scooped up 15 and 79 cents towards the latter end of the week. And if I could find, round out my play sets at like, let's say, uh, Ten total playsets. I'd be happy with that. Even paying a dollar twenty-five just to sit on an even forty. Yeah, it's not bad. No. Um, mine is going to be. We kind of touched on it uh, when we were talking about Vanifar. Kiki Jiki. Okay. Specifically for me, it's the Kamigawa art. Yep. So it's the only time that art was printed. Every kill condition in modern with pod is going to involve kiki jiki there is no way it does not no it can't happen uh it's a low printing it's a better art in my opinion mm-hmm. and the foils from that set the multiplier is like 10x whereas all of the master sets are depending on the set 1.5 to 2 times yeah and i could easily see if modern pod becomes a thing the non-foils reaching fifteen twenty dollars, maybe even as high as forty, while it's the flavor of the week after it wins a GP or something. Yeah. And right now you can get them on TCG. There's Urza's Toy Box has some for six ninety five, so seven dollars. Ridiculous. Yeah, that's insane. And you look at the Masters printings, and they're seven, eight dollars. They're all consistent with that. Even the From the Vault is seven dollars. And if if the deck is real, which it could be, there's no way that's a nine dollar card. Yeah. Because it's a mythic in all the master sets it was printed in. Mm-hmm. And Kamigawa had a smaller print run than all of those. Yeah, we were we were, we were talking, talking about it over the weekend. weekend uh, print, print run numbers. numbers. We were, we're pretty, pretty sure that Kamigawa's, if not print run, then at least open rate, 
Yeah, much, much like, like seventh edition, edition, but fewer, fewer copies, copies into, into the wild than in any of these master sets. Yeah. Uh, so I, for me, that's my pick for the week. Get in for less than ten, and you're never not going to be able to out it. So you're not going to take a loss on it. It's an EDH no. card. It's a legacy and modern card. Kiki Moon is still there, and people still play it. Yep. yep. But I think it's great for less than ten. I, I, I would agree. agree. The last thing I want to add is, well, as, as we were running uh, the numbers, numbers talking about print runs, we did find out that, that of the 300,000 or so decks on EDH track, Kiki Kiki makes up uh, 13,000 of those decks as a general alone, I believe. Yeah. Or maybe 13,000 is the general and uh, somewhere in the 99, which yeah. doesn't sound like a lot, but it is. It's not Sol Ring, it's not Monocrypt, it's not Monovolt. It's, it's a creature, creature that costs five and combos bodaciously. Yeah. 13,000 copies is a lot. I don't yeah. even think yeah. cards like Path to Exile, Swords, Swords Mushers, and, and Doom Blade are that common, on e- if you look on EDH rec. No. Like, this, this card, card has, has legs, and that difference multiplier that 10x is insane. I put up, yeah. I put up stocks, and at one point, it was an over $30 card, dipped to 20 and then it just kind of settled back into 10 Like This yeah. is an easy push. Yeah. Um, so yeah, there's our picks for the week, guys. Uh, tune in next week where we'll have some band predictions for what's going to happen. Um, hoping Kiki Jiki spikes more because Twin gets unbanned. There's your news flash. Yeah, right. uh, <laughs> until then, you can reach us at MTG Cabalcast on Twitter. Mm-hmm. You can reach Reptar at All Time Reptar on Twitter. Twitter, and I can be found at Thirsty Sizzler. So thanks for tuning in, guys. Appreciate it. Yep, and please remember to like and subscribe on YouTube and give us a five-star rating on iTunes if you can. Yep, really appreciate it. Thanks, guys. See ya.